Well, this morning, again, thank you so much for joining in and being a part of the service today. And I love those songs that we're singing this morning, and I hope they just encourage your spirit and your heart and just kind of lift you up. They certainly did me, so whether they did for you or not, I don't know what to say. But uh, for me, they were very encouraging. And um, it is so encouraging for us to be here together and to be worshiping together. My hope, again, is that we will discover God's love in a fresh, dynamic way. Um, And I think that's what we need these days, is for God to move through his church in a fresh way. And so I'm praying that we would be a part of that wave and that God would see fit to walk amongst us in in just a, a renewed, anointed way. And that we would know beyond a shadow of a doubt that, uh, that God is at work amongst us. Today, if you have your Bibles, we're going to jump into uh, a brand new series of messages called Building Great Relationships. Now, when someone was coming in early this morning, I said, you know, I'm going to be speaking on a series of messages called Building Mediocre Relationships. Doesn't have the same, <laughs> same ring, does it? And we don't want mediocre relationships. We don't want poor relationships. We want to build great relationships, and, uh, and so the last time that I spoke on this subject was back in 2019, and it uh, seems like it's such a long time ago, but, uh, but I wanted, to, I've just felt the Lord prompted me to step back into this, this series, or into a series of messages on relationships, because I think during the pandemic, I think the pandemic has hurt us in our relationships. People have become polarized, people have become paralyzed, and and it's impacted our relationships. Hardly a week goes by that I don't hear about a family that is still trying to heal from the hurt that they experience in the relationships over the pandemic issues. You know, some wanted to be vaccinated, some not, some wear masks, some not. And so I think one of the things that the pandemic has done to us It's revealed just how fragile our relationships are in our lives. And I think it's important that that we begin, especially for the church of the living Christ, to show by our example about how we can overcome polarization, how we don't have to be paralyzed just because we think differently on things, but we can set an example about what God wants to do through us. And so therefore, I want us... here at Spotlight, I want us to help heal where we hurt. I want to help, help for us to help where we can. And so the message that I want to share today that's going to kick off this series of messages about building great relationships is a message that I have preached before. Now, my seminary professor told me, he says, if you, if you can't preach it a second of time, you shouldn't have preached it the first time, all right? And uh, so I agree with him. So I'm, I, didn't, I didn't agree with everything he said, but I agree with him on that. But, but I preached this message back in 2017, and it's a message entitled, Life's Greatest Aim. And, and as I share this message, I want it to be the message that kicks off this series. And it's a message that is built on 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and I want to read you a chapter for you this morning because it's very short. And then we're going to finish off with 1 Corinthians 14 and just verse 1. Actually, just the first part of verse 1. And so if you have your Bibles, you can follow along. And I just want to read it for you this morning. Then we'll jump right into the message. If I could speak all the languages of the earth and of angels, but didn't, have, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy... And if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that could move mountains but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't have love, but if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud. Or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wrong. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices when, whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, or love never fails. 
never loses faith. It's always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. Prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless, but love will last forever. Now our knowledge is partial and incomplete, and even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture. But when the time of perfection comes, these partial things will become useless. When I was a child, I spoke and thought and I reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things, hopefully. Now, hopefully it's not in there. I just kind of added that in, all right? So now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete, but then I will know everything completely. Just Is it guaranteed? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There we go. Yeah, the power is back. There we go. I'm just kidding. So how would you fill in that blank? The aim of my life is what? Think about it for a moment this morning. Don't, don't just let this question pass you by. Think about it. The aim of my life is what? Is it success? Is that what you get up and get up in the morning and try to do? Is the aim of your life happiness? You want to be happy? Is the aim of your life is to be comfortable? Is the aim of your life to have security and feel safe and, and all of that? Is the aim of your life to, for other people to recognize you and say, wow, there goes so-and-so. They know who I am, you know? Is the aim of your life to have fun every day? Some people, you know, especially when you, when you talk sometimes in the, uh, the younger generation, what's the aim of your life? Oh, I just want every day just to rock, you know, just to kind of have a, a great time, have, have some fun. And then again, the aim of your life, if you're a parent, uh, and you know, especially if you have a baby, and we're going to have, you know, uh, when uh, Nicholas and Liberty come here with their new baby, Opal, I think the aim of their life is just going to have a dry diaper. You know, I think that's probably the aim they're going to have. So what's the aim of your life? Is it to be well known? Is it to be approval? The reason I asked that question this morning, because how you answer that question determines your dominant life principle. How you answer that question is what really is most important to you. Now, Scripture says, make love, make love your greatest aim. Or let love be your highest goal. Let it be your dominant principle that you live by. And every one of us has a dominant principle. We do. Every one of us has something that dominates our every day. Your dominant life principle is what you refer to unconsciously every day, and when you're faced with choices in your life, you will always default to that dominant life principle. And so what is it? What is it that gets you going? So for instance, if your dominant life principle is to have fun, then when you get two invitations to go to somebody's place and to go out for the evening, you're probably going to choose the one where you're going to have more fun at. You'll probably say, oh, let's just go to so-and-so's place. They are so much fun. We can go there. All right? Or 
if your dominant life principle is to play it safe, you're probably going to choose the, the invitation that is less risky. Or if your dominant value is to, to be comfortable, then you're going to probably choose the invitation that's going to maybe give you the easiest and the most comfortable thing. And so that dominant life principle, every one of us has that that we default to in our lives. What does God say should be our dominant life principle? That's what the, the, the message is about today. What is our life aim? What is it that you want to do more than anything else? And this morning, I hope, is to make love your greatest aim. As I share this message today, I'm not talking about that as something that's fluffy, emotional. I'm not talking about, but I'm talking about a love that has depth to it. Our world knows a lot about sex and lust and all of those things, but knows very little about what is real, authentic love. It's so true. And so today, I want us to be encouraged to think about how we can make love our greatest aim. Love would be our dominant life principle. It's what we default to when we're faced with circumstances. When someone who is irritable comes up to you and starts irritating you, what is your default? Is your default just to avoid them, or is your default to find a way to love them? You know, and there's all kinds of examples in life. 1 Corinthians says we ought to make love our greatest aim in our life. Because it should be our highest priority. So if you have your notes this morning, and Jeff Moon said, how am I going to make it through five, five points? But, um, but uh, here we go. Where I'm going to give you the five points of why love should be your highest priority. Why love is something that should dominate your life. Number one, without love, all that I say that comes out of my mouth, all that I say is ineffective. Isn't that what it says there in verse 1? If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I am only a resounding gong and a clanging cymbal. You know, words without love are just empty words. Just noise. The world is impressed by great communicators. The world is impressed by people who have charisma. You know, as we see politicians out on the trail, people oftentimes choose a politician based on how charismatic they may be. Not that they have the gifts of the Spirit or whatever, but charisma, how much charisma. And so, so the world is impressed by great communicators, but God is not impressed by that. He says words without love are nothing. They're ineffective. The Corinthians, in which this passage was written, the Corinthians, they prided themselves on being great orators and being able to get up in public and give great speeches. They were proud of their eloquence that they could begin to debate things around, or even their spiritual eloquence. They said, we can speak in the tongues of men and of angels. And I've met some believers who maybe didn't use those words, but <laughs> they gave you the same impression. Oh, you need to listen to me because I can speak, you know, in the tongue of men and of angels. And there are people amongst us who are very, very eloquent and, and have that great gift, but we need to realize that without love, all that I say is ineffective. It's nothing. And so today, I want to encourage us as we think about this to realize that we need to be really uh, tuned in to the fact that, yes, I can be, I can say all kinds of things, but is it backed up with love is my dominant life principle is to love people authentically honestly not just with words you know i love hot dogs i love ice cream i love you know i can use the word love in so many different ways but i think we need to start realizing that we need to love authentically beyond just the word but also with action so all that i say without love is ineffective I've had couples come to me over the years for counseling, and uh, the common phrase that I'll hear in my counseling is, Pastor, we're just not communicating in our home. And, uh, and when you dig a little deeper, and I ask them, have you ever thought about um, maybe the way that you're speaking to one another? Are you speaking to one another in a loving way, or are you speaking to each other harshly? Because when someone is speaking harshly, I don't care who the person is, the other one is going, tune you out. But if we learn to speak with love, 
then people will listen. And people always listen. And people will respond to loving words. But we resent and oftentimes reject unloving words. Such a powerful thing. With, if I speak and have in, with, of tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am nothing. Number two, without love, all that I know is incomplete. All that I know is incomplete. Notice there in that verse it says, If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, then it says at the end of it, But have not love, I am nothing. And without love, all that I know is incomplete. You can be the most educated person there is. You can have so many uh, degrees behind your name that people will call you Dr. Fahrenheit or something like that. You can have all of that, but you know what, folks? It doesn't matter if you have not love. Without love, you're nothing. You can be a genius. You can be brilliant. You can be a walking Bible encyclopedia. You can memorize whole books of the Bible. You can, you can quote the New Testament. You can split theological hair 16 different ways. You can answer all the Bible questions in, in Bible studies that you attend. You can unscrew the unscrutable, but God says it doesn't matter if you don't have love. Without love, all that I know is incomplete. Love is what seals the deal. The Bible says that knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. It's better to have a right heart than to have a right head. Come on. It's better to have a right heart in these days when everybody's split, when people are polarized and paralyzed, it's better to have a right heart. Show mercy. Show love. Compassion. To those that think differently, maybe look differently, whatever. The world is exploding today with all kinds of information. Oh, man. I mean, everybody's on Google. And information is all over the place. Uh, and frankly, I can't even keep up with it. I really can't. Yet, any of man's basic problems, are they being solved? I don't think so. I think the world is not looking for more knowledge. Hear me this morning. The world is looking for more love. We don't need more five steps on how to do this and more knowledge about how to better plant your tomatoes, even though it's lovely. We need more love, authentic, real, love that has a depth. So without love, all that I say is ineffective, and all that I know is incomplete. Number three, all that I believe is insufficient. All that I believe is insufficient. Notice this. It says there in 1 Corinthians 13, if I have faith that can move mountains. Wow, that's an incredible faith. How many of you have moved a mountain today? Other than your spouse, all right? I don't want you being like that, all right? How many of you have moved a mountain today to have that kind of faith where Jesus said, say to the mountain, cast yourself into the sea, and it will be done? That's a pretty, pretty substantial. If I can have a faith that can move mountains but have not love, I'm nothing. I'm nothing. It doesn't, and, I, and hear me when I say this, because on one hand it does, but it doesn't matter what you believe, if you don't have love, it doesn't count. Even for those of us who are professing the truth of the gospel, hear me when I say this, we need to profess and teach the gospel and the full counsel of God's word. We must. We must not compromise from it. But you know what? You can do that and do it from a position where you really don't love. And when you do that, you actually do more harm for the gospel than good. And so churches today... We need to be reminded of that, that all that I believe is insufficient if I have not love. I may have the truth, and I may have everything that God wants me to know, and I may, may, may be the, the, you know, the most faithful to it, but if I have not love, it makes it insufficient. It's not enough. So there is a misconception that all there is to being a Christian involves just believing certain truths. 
we have this idea that to be a Christian, as long as I believe the certain doctrines or hold the certain beliefs, but I want to be honest with you this morning, someone can say, I'm a Christian and I believe in Jesus. Well, the Bible says, big deal. So does the devil. The devil believes, according to the book of James, that Jesus is the Son of God. And he trembles and he shakes. So believing is not enough. It's insufficient. And so we need to do more than that. We need to demonstrate a a godly love through our lives. And so this morning, I just want to ask you, do you love Jesus? And do you realize he loves you? And do you love other people in the same way that Jesus loves you? Do you love other people in Jesus' name? Christianity is a lifestyle, and it is a lifestyle of love. It is. It really is. And sometimes today, when we begin to think about, why do I feel empty? Why is it that maybe church is going to church and being a part of a particular fellowship feels kind of hollow and empty? I think sometimes it's because churches have lost their way in knowing how to show love to one another. That's why at the end of a service, you'll say to me, you'll hear me say, take time, please, take time to show love and encouragement to one another. We need that today. Any amens on that? All right. Just checking to see if you're asleep. Galatians chapter 5, verse 6 says, the only thing that counts, notice this, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Through love. I think maybe some of us need to write this verse on our busy calendars. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. And we need to be reminded to take time in our busy lives to express our faith through love with our colleagues at work, with the cashier in the grocery store, with the person who is three layers of glass behind you at the gas station that's trying to take your payment for gas, find a way to express your faith through love and encouragement. Number four, all that I give is insignificant. It says there in 1 Corinthians 13, if I give all I possess to the poor but have not love, I gain nothing. This says that you can give everything you've got. You can empty out your wallet. You can empty out your bank account. You can do more than just drop your tithe in the offering. Um, You can give everything you have and still have not love. Why? Because you can give out of selfish motives. You don't need love to give. You really don't. You can give out of selfish motives. A guy told me one time, he says, I don't understand. I've given my wife everything she's wanted, but she's divorcing me. And and so you can buy your wife the biggest diamond in the world, but if you don't love her, interesting, it doesn't count. And of course, I'm picking on the men here. All right. And anybody wants to buy me a diamond, I'll take it, and I'll love you for it. But, uh, But so... Again, even in our culture today, with families split up and the way homes are, you see parents who have become parents that have this deep sense of guilt and they try to buy their kids with all kinds of stuff, but what the child really wants is their love. Is their love. Matter of fact, you can give them a cardboard box with love and that'll be way more important to them than a $300 pair of sneakers or whatever it may be. Well, maybe if they're a teenager, cardboard box may not work that well, but I think you get the idea. Love. All that I give is insignificant if I don't have love. Just because you give doesn't mean you're doing it in love. If you don't do it in love, it doesn't matter. Number five. How am I doing, Jeff? Am I? Okay, good. All right. All I accomplish is inadequate. If without love, all that I accomplish in life is inadequate if I have not love. If I were burned alive, and this is from the Living Bible, if I were burned alive for preaching the gospel, 
but I didn't love others, it would be of no value whatsoever. All right? If I were burned alive, and I don't want to be, I don't want to test that, all right? And so let's just, let's just kind of take that example for what it is. If I were burned alive for preaching the gospel, but I didn't love others, it would be of no value. So all that I accomplish is inadequate. I can rack up a list of impressive achievements. I can succeed in all kinds of great accomplishments. I really, all of us could. I could even sacrifice my life for the greatest cause in the world, by the way, which is the kingdom of God. But without love, it won't matter zip. It's wasted effort. So this morning, as you think about what is your dominant life principle, Spotlight Church, I am asking you to really stop, just time out, and think about what it is that is your greatest aim in life. I hope it in this culture that is, and I've said it in my prayer, in our culture that likes to talk about being woke, folks, our culture is broke. It really is. And in the midst of all of this, we need the church of the living God to rise up and to show an example. And the greatest example we could show this world today is not how we can put up bouncy castles and cotton candy machines. It's not about all of that. But the greatest thing this world is looking for is love. Authentic love. When people come through our doors to know that they are valued and appreciated. When they come through our doors that they're not just showered with empty words, but they're showered with genuine love. So this morning, as we conclude this message, these verses that we point to, we need to be reminded that success without love is empty. One day, God's going to put an audit on your life he's going to put an audit on my life and he's going to evaluate our lives and he's going he's not going to focus on all your accomplishments he's not going to focus on all the money you gave away or put in the offering he's not going to focus on your bank account he's going to look at your relationships and he's going to evaluate how you lived and today if you have relationships in your life that are broken Folks, you need to take time and heal them. Don't just cast them aside. There are people that I encounter that, folks, they are just very difficult people. No, I'm not going to point. I'm not going to point at any yes or or anything like that. So, but you know what? You've got to find a way to love, and God will help you do that. I looked up the word love in the dictionary. The Oxford Dictionary defines love as this. Love is an intense feeling of deep affection. And I just want to conclude the message today by reminding you that love is not an emotion. Love affects our emotions. Love creates emotions. Love causes emotions. But love is not an emotion. You can't control it. I mean, love, love is something you can't control. It's not an emotion that you, can't, that you can't control because love is not an emotion. And again, as we look at this, we need to ask ourselves the question, how am I going to practice love, Pastor? How am I going to practice this love in a practical way? Well, if I were to ask you a question today, especially when you look at verses 4 to 8 of 1 Corinthians 13, it talks about very practical things you can do, and we're going to sort of go through these a little bit in this series. In verses 4 to 18, it gives you all the practical things you need to do. Love is patient, love is kind, does not envy, and so forth. So the question we need to ask ourselves this morning, as we conclude this time, is what kind of lover are you? I'm waiting to say that. What kind of lover are you? I think that's a great question. We need to remind ourselves that love, even though it's not an emotion, it is an action. It's not something you feel. Something you say, love is something you do. Matter of fact, when you look at verses 4 to 8, it says that love is kind. It's an action. And as you go through that list, it's a list of actions that you can do that reminds you that what love is. So love is an action. Number two, love is a choice. It is. At the end of the day, you can choose to love or you can choose not to love. There is a myth that goes around that says that love is uncontrollable. Well, I just fell in love. It's kind of like falling in a ditch. Uh, I just fell in love. 
And my Greek word for that comes out again. It's called hogwash. And uh, you can look it up in the Greek. It's right there. But love is a choice. You don't just fall into it. That's why people in our world say, I fell out of love. No, that's not true. Stop lying to yourself. You chose not to love anymore. That's what it is. And it has its consequences. You choose not to love. It's your choice. And so today I want to encourage you. And I want to remind you today as a church family, as we think about building great relationships, that love is giving to each other what we need, not what we deserve. That's love. It's an action. It's a choice. Verse 13, and I'll finish with this, says this. In this life, we have three lasting qualities. And this is interesting to me. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest, even more than faith, even more than hope, the greatest of these is love. Why is love greater than faith and hope? Well, folks, one day when we get to heaven, we won't need any more faith. We'll see it all. The beauty and the wonder, the gloriousness of heaven. And we'll, it'll be worth it all. We won't need faith then. We won't need hope then when we get to heaven. Because we don't need to hope anymore because it's right there. There's the crystal sea, there's, there's my mom and my dad, there's, there's the people that have gone on before me. I don't need hope anymore, I'm here, it's over. No more pain, no more sorrow, no more tears, no more crying. One day, I don't need hope anymore. It's right, in, right here with me. But when you get to heaven, there will always be love. God so loved the world, and he will do it for all eternity. But the greatest of these is love. So this morning, let me ask you as we close, what kind of lover are you going to be? Are you going to be the person that loves as Jesus does in Jesus' name? Will you be the one that will practice that love here on this side of heaven before we even get there? I hope so. Because the world today needs that more than anything else. Make love your greatest aim. Let it be your default life principle that you go to. Let it guide you every single day. Let love permeate and be permanent in your life. Let's stand together in closing. Our Father, this morning, I want to thank you for bringing us together, and I thank you for this time that we have shared. And I just ask that you would... Help us not to simply hear these words and walk out the door and forget about them. But Lord, help us today to take these words and apply it to our hearts. Lord, these are not my words, but these are yours. And so God, today I've done the best I can to share a message that hopefully is relevant and that will help us. And Lord, I just have been honest with what I feel God you're calling us to do. Lord, there are so many families that are polarized and broken because of this pandemic. There are so many communities, I can think of all kinds of communities, uh, where people have become paralyzed and polarized because of their different ideas and thoughts. And relationships have become broken and shattered. God, today, let your church rise up in the ashes of all of this and be a shining light of what that love looks like. Lord, we're not perfect. We're going to say things and do things, and we're going to have feelings that maybe aren't always honoring in the way they should be, but God, help us not just to say, oh, well, that's what it means to be human, but God, help us by your grace to love and go back and say, I'm sorry, and go back and, and rebuild that which is broken. That takes more courage than anything. God, today, help us to do that in all of our relationships, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.